Hello, everybody, and welcome to season two. I have my friend from season one, my inspiration with me. Um, it would be a miss of me to begin without acknowledging what's happened um, since we were last on air, so to speak. Um, of course, what I'm talking about is the farmers' protest. And I know that many of you, like myself, diaspora descendants, directly related to people on the front line or supporting on and offline will be following this momentous movement. That's pan-India very closely. Um, so here from the UK, uh, Punjab Heritage Association, we really want to just say that we unequivocally stand with the farmers' protest and with all people who are standing up for human rights and against fascism and against racism. Um, we made the similar acknowledgement last summer, of course, with the Black Lives Matter. Um, and this is an inclusive platform. So of course, there might be people who are allies on our platform who might not necessarily be from Punjabi Sikh Indian descent, um, but we are all allies in the cause. Um, and I'm in my personal tribute wearing a Fulgari Jinni that my grandmother made, um, a farmer. Um, and uh, I have relatives on the front line. So it's an issue quite deep and close to my heart as well. Um, and on that note, on our global note, I say officially welcome to our season opener and our very special friend of the book club, Satnam Singhira, with his instant bestseller, as you can see, Satnam. Some res a little bit of research has been done, just a little bit. <laughs> so before I begin with you, Satnam, I'm just going to um, give a little recap on um, Satnam, and here we go. Satnam, of course, is an award-winning journalist for the Times. He joined us last year, and we talked through in great detail his memoir, which was turned into a film, and also the fact that he wrote a novel. Today, we're not going to recap on those issues. Um, the next slide is just a little recap of something that we talked to Satnam about, which was his Times journalism. Of course, he's a columnist there and he's a writer. And last year when he came on board with us, he talked a lot about what he was writing at the time, uh, following the coronavirus and, of course, living with his nieces. Today, very much, we're focusing on Empire Land. Now, there's a little bit of an inspiration that we... Um, managed to get an insight into last year when Satnam joined us, a little sneak preview. It relates to this documentary that he made on Channel 4. It was to mark the Dalianwala Bagh centenary. Um, Satnam was very kind to join us and give us uh, the insight into that, making that journey, making the journey of self-discovery and also sharing how it inspired Empire Land. Now, when he came on board with us, he was um, still drafting, still editing, I believe, Satanam, and so much has happened since. Um, one of the really big things that have happened, of course, is Black Lives Matter. We mentioned that. And I really wanted to set the context because, of course, Satanam, I believe you've been writing this book for four years. So you wrote it very much with a lot of foresight. There's a little screen grab of something that you shared with us that was in its draft form, the manuscript. And there, of course, the book is in its full glory. Um, Satnam, you mentioned when you were with us um, that you were hoping that the issue would be very topical. But of course, I'm wondering whether you knew just how topical it would become once you actually launched this book. Um, if people don't know, this came out on the 28th of January. So we're talking less than three weeks ago. In its very short lifespan, it has already sparked a lot of conversation. We're going to get into that, as well as the content of the book itself. Um, it's fair to say, if we look at the context, we have almost daily headlines on the so-called culture wars, um, people from all sides of that debate contributing. Now, one little insight um, to set the scene, uh, I'm going to ask my namesake to push on to the next slide, is... Um, Satanam, you wrote even just today about this idea of how you, the book very much encapsulates this in terms of thinking of a solution around some of the issues that we face when we talk about the culture wars. We're going to get on to how you found it in terms of personally writing about this book. And the very last, uh, last slide I'm just going to ask Amandeep to forward on to is a survey, which I think is a really good way to say 
look, this is all happening now. These attitudes aren't something that we're trying to resurrect from the past. Empire nostalgia is very much here and now. The second slide in particular there, um, the second little screen grab, the YouGov poll, 27% of Brits wish they still had an empire. I think that's a really good starting point. And on that note, I'm gonna bring in Sadhanam and say congratulations and thank you for writing this. On thank the you. note of how timely you thought it would be, did you realize? Uh, no, and I had no idea. And to be honest, when I began it, it was quite an esoteric subject. I did a reading in uh, Jikoni, an Indian restaurant, and Amandeep, the other one, was there. And this general reaction was one of vague confusion, to be honest. Um, when I began it, it was, it began basically after I did that documentary, and it, it struck me when I was in India and also researching what empire was like in 1919, that the way the Sikhs were treated in Imperial India echoed the way they were treated in, in modern Britain, in post-war Britain that weird mixture of indulgence and kind of subjugation. But it was quite, a, I guess, focusing on the legacies of empire. It's not something that's really been done. When people write about British empire until recently, it's been about whether empire was good or bad. You know, there's this national obsession with the balance sheet approach to empire where there's an idea that we can balance the good, you know, the railways against the bad, the massacres, and somehow come to a conclusion that it was good or bad. And generally the conclusion in Britain is that it was good in that there's a, a popular view now that to be proud of being British, you need to be proud of imperial history. And it's such a toxic debate. And my book in a way is not really focused on that. It's not about the legacies that we live with. It's about how our racism has been created by the history of empire, how our multiculturalism was created by empire, our politics, our psychology, our wealth, how much of that comes from empire? And these are questions that became very popular during the Black Lives Matter movement. But I was towards the end of writing my book then, it was quite weird for me to suddenly see my concerns all over the BBC News on a daily basis. To be honest, it freaked me out. And uh, it was exciting, but also terrifying in a way, because it's, I find it's much better to write a book that slowly finds an audience. But this is my first ever experience of writing something where there's been hype. Um, so it's been scary, but also exciting. And as well as the hype, because of course, as we said, it was, it's an instant bestseller. Um, there has been backlash to acknowledge that in terms of saying that you're in a safe space. You're amongst friends today. <laughs> the internet and is fun. not a safe space. Lifetime... <laughs> but I would say there's, there's many of us in this audience who are lifetime uh, fully paid up members of the Sat Nam Sangera fan club. Um, but in terms of the backlash, tell me about that, because before we get into the content of the book, the conversation it sparked, the, the issue in terms of, should you even be allowed to talk about this? Yeah, I should say before I talk about the backlash that generally the, the most common response has been from people like me who weren't taught about empire at school and are grateful to have you know a balanced book that isn't too long that explains what happened. And um, that was my ambition really. But yeah, there has been, I expected an intense reaction, but it's been a lot more intense than I, you know, really planned for. There's been, you know, days of trolling when I went on the Nihal show, probably four or five days of racist trolling. There have been, you know, vicious letters, death threats and so on. So it's been a bit bewildering. I think that's because of the, what I mentioned earlier, there's a view that to be proud of being British, you need to be proud of being proud of imperial history. And if you point out that that imperial history features massacres and exploitation and genocide, that really offends people who see themselves as patriotically British. Secondly, when you're talking about empire, you're talking about race. You're talking about white people conquering brown people. So that adds another layer of toxic toxicness, if that's the word. Um, and the other challenging thing for people is that I'm brown. And I think in our lifetime, imperial history has always been taught, at least when it comes to TV, with white men appearing on BBC Two, you know, telling the world how it is in relation to the Indian railways. It's been people like Jeremy Paxman and Nara Ferguson and so on. But now suddenly there are brown people, there's David Oshiloga, there's me, you know, and we're talking about empire. And when I go on radio and talk to another brown person, Nihal, that triggers a lot of people, you know, and 
it's a toxic subject to talk about. And on that note, I wondered whether on reflection, you have this brilliant note, it's on page 189, whether you've reflected on if this should have been part of the introduction. I'm just going to ask you if you wouldn't mind like sharing it with us, because I think it's um, best if we hear your words spoken yeah, by so you. There's a popular idea. Actually, no. Yeah, there's a popular idea. Where I'll find the page, actually. When brown people write about empire or talk about empire, the number one criticism, which is what I had with the documentary, is why don't you shut up? Why don't you be more grateful for what this country has given to you? And that is a racist idea and a trope. And I, I thought I'd add a footnote in the book to explain why. So I'll just read it out. It's not very long. It's in response to the fact that I get a lot of emails saying, why don't you be more grateful? And I'm saying, for what it's worth, I am actually grateful for a great deal. And because the accusation will inevitably be leveled at me, I might as well spell out what I am grateful for. I'm grateful for having had a free education at one of the best grammar schools in the country, for having attended for free one of the best colleges at one of the, one of the most successful universities in the world, for a national health service that cares for the people I love the most, for a welfare state that saved my family from the most crushing consequences of poverty, for the chance to live in the greatest city on earth and work on two of the greatest newspapers in the world, for British pop music, for the glorious British countryside, for Pizza Express. But I resent being instructed to demonstrate my gratitude whenever I analyse any, any aspect of British life, when my white colleagues don't get the same treatment. Yes, I have had a better life than I probably would have had in India, but I was born here, not in India. I am British. I am as entitled to comment on my home nation as the next man, and the endless insistence that I display my gratitude is rooted in racism. Racism, which is in itself rooted in the fact that the children of imperial immigrants born here are not always seen as fully British. I'm sure almost half the people listening to me talk now have had that experience or had that accusation of being ungrateful. And I think that's why it's brilliant to hear you say that in full and acknowledge this point. I know that you've spoken about this very openly, this idea of a reversal of hierarchy, who gets to have the right to observe, have the right to bring awareness and the right to criticise. Um, and I guess that's why I wanted to start our discussion very much in that context, that writing something like this, it's a brave move. It's, um, I wonder whether you knew just how brave you had to be when you were writing it. Um, and, I, and I guess on that point, you've been living with your nieces as you've been writing it. And you speak very openly about the younger generation being bold and uncensored. Did that encourage you to be more unflinching in your assessment of history? No, I do find the way younger people approach colonial history very inspiring because I think we just weren't taught about it, but young people know quite a lot. And I think that's because they get their history and their news from the internet and different sources. I mean, there's the Brown History Instagram account that I'm sure lots of people follow, which tell, teaches them a lot about history. There's the Black Panther film, which is incredibly bold about the way in which museums get their artifacts. And it's, I think it's the ninth most popular film in the history of the world, you know? So I feel like young people are very animated. They care a lot about Black Lives Matter but the older generation isn't. And actually there's a reaction against it, you know, which is you're, you're seeing now in our government where they've realized and they want to sow division around the subject of empire, you know, that they want to, you've got ministers saying, you know, we need to take on the woke. The woke people who attack our history are gonna be destroyed by us and that kind of mentality. And it's, it's absurd because you know what? Historical facts don't have feelings. I don't think you should use history to feel pride. I don't think you should use history to feel shame. It's got nothing to do with you. It's not your fault this happened. I'm British. I don't feel ashamed at what happened. You know, I wasn't involved. Our only duty is to face the facts, you know. But the problem is the story of British Empire is the way it's discussed in our popular culture is loaded with emotion on both sides. I think you're absolutely right on that point. And thank you for acknowledging this context. Um, you mentioned David Olasogo earlier. He puts it brilliantly. He talks about this idea that criticizing people who criticize history is almost like it's a post fact, post truth history. Um, the way we're rapidly moving into, and I believe his quote is a post truth politics. Um, 
so there's allies in this field. And of course, as we said, we, we are supporting you in this endeavor. In terms of delving into the actual book itself, James O'Brien in his podcast with you, um, I thought he summed it up brilliantly. He said, Empire Land manages to be both history and biography. And this idea that he explored with you, if you can expand on this, um, this idea here with us as well, um, that you turn something universal through, you know, you take a personal experience to talk about something quite universal. Tell us why that style of um, narrative was really kind of inviting for you. I guess I've always done that. I've used my own story to often talk about a very difficult things. So with my memoir, I was trying to talk about schizophrenia, which is the, one of the hardest subjects in the world because it's one of the most disturbing illnesses. But I had personal experience of it with my parents, with my father and my sister. And I find, I have found the one lesson I've had from my writing career is that if you humanize it, if you give people a reason to care, they will watch. They, I mean, I think most people wouldn't pick up a book about schizophrenia but they might be, pick up my memoir because it's got jokes in it and maybe they care about the narrator. But I also realize it annoys certain people, this approach. And I, I guess I had a bit of a backlash with the Janine waller Bog um, doc documentary where some Sikhs thought I made it too much about myself and it should have been a more straight documentary. The thing is, Channel 4 wouldn't have commissioned a straight documentary on it. It's just not the way they work to attract a broad audience. You have to give people who don't care a reason to care. And it's the same thing in Empire Land. I guess I've used my own ignorance as a way into the story, hopefully with the, idea, with the view that there's a lot of people out there like me, you know? I think if you know a lot about British imperial history, this isn't the book for you. You know, you probably know everything already, but I feel like most people, you don't know enough, then yeah, I mean, come with me and join my, basically I'm gonna, it's four years of reading I've done that you, I'm basically doing for you. So you can come with me and come on that journey and hopefully have the same experience. And you have proof of the reading. I think almost a third of the book, I've just highlighted it there right at the end, is actually your bibliography and your index. I mean, it's just like amazing the, 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 the source material, the first-hand sources that you refer to um, in this book. On the point of um, who it's for, as you say, perhaps it's not for everybody, but in your self-deprecating style, um, you, you use your hallmark wit to draw us in and to give us that position as someone who's on a journey, a journey of self-discovery. I wondered um, if you could talk a little bit about um, how passionately you feel about changing the British curriculum when it comes to the history syllabus. Um, I watched this brilliant talk that you gave with Speakers for School in collaboration with Penguin's Books last week. And um, it was just, first of all, the question from the students was fantastic. So to our audience, you really have to up your game because there were some brilliant questions there. And also you, you just managed to kind of like um, balance this kind of need with inspiring students to learn more, but also a case of like, how do we actually process this really painful history as well? Yeah, I mean, the amnesia is like, it's everywhere in our culture. And the, we need to understand British imperial history to understand racism. We created many modern notions of race and racism. We need to understand imperial history to understand why we're a multicultural society. Why are you and I here? Well, you're in the Middle East, but you know, why are we British? It's because a bunch of English people went over to India in the 17th and 18th century, right? Um, but the history is routinely, uh, you know, wiped away and it's like, how many Remembrance Day services have you sat through? I probably sat through 50 in my life and no one has ever mentioned that Imperial troops fought in their millions in both world wars. And then as soon as they'd been used and the wealth of India had been used, they were forgotten about. And that seems to be routine. And it also, the way we talk about the Indian railways on TV, it's just, it's made a subject of rose tinted nostalgia. You know, when in actual fact, the railways weren't built for the Indians, they were built for the British to take away resources and to make it easier to keep hold of India in a military way. And, um, but the level of amnesia is so profound. I mean, the most shocking point for me was in Tony Blair's autobiography where he said, to his talking about handing back Hong Kong. And he said, you know, to be honest, I didn't really understand the history. I find that amazing that you can be handing back Hong Kong and you don't know the history and you don't, you bet the Chinese know the history. The Chinese teach the opium wars in school. 
you know? Similarly in India and Jalin Wallabagh, you know, everyone I met knew the story of Jalin Wallabagh and you meet British Sikhs, I was amongst them, who don't know about Jalin Wallabagh. And I think this amnesia is bizarre given British Empire is the biggest thing that ever happened to Britain, you know? It also explains so many things about the Sikhs, you know? We, we are imperial, we took the side of the British after the mutiny, you know, we fought in both world wars. We emigrated to Africa in huge numbers. We emigrated to Britain in huge numbers. And it's, it's who we are. And the most, the single most shocking for me, so shocking thing for me was discovering that our reputation for being a martial race is in part created by the British because we took their side after the mutiny and they basically st started making huge race, racist generalizations about all sorts of groups. So they decided the Bengalis were effeminate and not to be trusted because they'd rebelled. And they decided that we were to be trusted and we were warlike and started writing handbooks about how we had the right size noses and ears, you know, to be fighters. And that notion of us is so profound that it's almost the prison through which we see ourselves, you know. It's not entirely because we, they were, the gurus did make us a military people, but the British, the power of British imperialism on our psychology is huge. And I think we need to understand it. I feel like I haven't answered your question because I forgot what it was halfway through the question. I, I think what you're saying is spot on, so I won't interrupt you at all at that point, but I will just pick up that on the, on the issue of the Sikh um, identity in, in uh, imperialism and me, this particular chapter, you do talk about this nuanced point, both the British concept and the narrative that was um, emphasized, but also as you acknowledge in, in your point there that the Sikhs had some role in creating the image of themselves as fighters. And you talk about Guru Hargobind Singh Ji and also Guru um, Gobind Singh Ji as well. So there's, um, I think what's, brilliant about the book is meticulously researched and then you allow space for paradoxes you allow space for readers to have questions and to remain with their questions I, I feel like it's one of those rare history books which is not binary and it's a rare um, insight into something which is so controversial and but yet you don't come down on one side of the argument you allow people to basically take the facts so coming back to the issue of the school curriculum. Um, Which I didn't answer. <laughs> well, this is why, isn't it? I've mm. just circled right back. <laughs> um, something like this could really sit well in the school curriculum because it encourages critical thinking as opposed to how we started out this discussion talking about the culture wars, um, just making everything binary, black and white. Do you encourage the listener, the viewer, the reader, to very much make up their own mind with the research that you've provided. Yeah, the problem with the national curriculum is that we've got a bunch of national uh, culture warriors in charge. And actually, I mean, so we've got a bunch of right-wing conservatives who are trying to sow division around empire and, you know, are talking about history that needs to be deleted because they don't agree with it. It's just bizarre. But it, there's a problem on the left as well. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn, when he was in charge of the Labour Party, was talking about how we need to teach the crimes of empire to children. And I don't think that's the way to do it either, you know? And it's been really flattering the way loads of teachers have leapt upon the book and are already planning to teach it. But I can't see it becoming on the, on the national curriculum because I do have a go at the, a, a lot of our current politicians. I mean, Boris Johnson is our single most imperially nostalgic politician we've ever had. He's in his spare time, he writes books on Churchill, talks about flag-waving piccaninnies and watermelons melon smiles. He reads out a poem from Rudyard Kipling in Burma. You know what I mean? He's like, he's so steeped in imperial nostalgia that I don't think there's any help of his government teaching, encouraging the balanced teaching of empire. But the great thing is the national curriculum doesn't have to be followed by private schools and by academies. And there's so many academies now. And I sense teachers are just rebelling and doing their own thing. There's incredible work being done by individual teachers. So I'm just gonna concentrate on that. I have no hope to help our government come up with a sensible national curriculum, to be honest. So you sense the fact that perhaps you've been so bold that it might um, negate its chances of being on the curriculum. But as you engage in that idea of um, 
critiquing the current government, as well as the opposition or the former opposition, I, just, I should say. Um, was there a point at which you were editing and writing this, and it's so bang on, spot on timing wise, that you just felt like, well, just one more little edit before it gets published, before it gets goes out to print, um, because it reads as if as, as if it was finished in January. Yeah, no, um, I did think about including a chapter on slavery, sorry, statues, because that was the whole debate was focused on statues, and I had nothing about statues. But then ultimately, I concluded, no, because they're always statues. I mean, they're not, people generally don't even notice them. The debates they've caused have been fascinating and important. But the statues themselves aren't imp as important as our racism, as our politics, as our multiculturalism. And I just thought, I don't want to focus on statues. It's just a proxy for a bigger debate, you know. But um, yeah, the book was much longer also when I wrote it. It was probably 100,000 words. And my editor cut it down a lot, a lot. But I had a lot of, um, I had the most vicious arguments I've ever had with my editor because she wanted it to be, she wanted to be much more angry than it is. And she wanted me to delete, she wanted me to delete that footnote that I read out, for example. She wanted me to delete out a lot of the places where I say, actually, you know, there's two sides. She wanted less nuance because you know what? Angry books sell really well. So like Inglorious Empire, you know, it probably would have sell, sold even more if I'd been angry, but it's not me and it's not how I felt. And I just thought, you know what? I've got to live with this book for the rest of my life. It's got to reflect how I feel. And I have confused feelings. And I think we need nuance. And also the Sikhs are in, a, are in the middle of it because you know what? We went along with large parts of empire. I can't be angry about empire, you know what I mean? Because my ancestors like yours, were compromised by it but so I think we're in a way we're the ideal community to navigate it. I'd agree with you and I think it's anachronistic to judge our ancestors as well in terms of and I think you allow this paradox and this area of contradiction for example my great-grandfather has spoken to you and Amandeep Madra has been instrumental in helping me research his history fought in the British Indian Army rose to the most significant position an Indian could get to, because of course there was a ceiling, um, and then rebelled after World War I because he saw that the, the promises that were made to the Indian people, and you know, this is very complex, and of course you go into this with your Jalimwala Bagh section here, um, he rebelled and lost his very significant military pension because he was actually part of the Indian independence movement. So those kind of contradictory um, possibly seen as contradictory behavior from, from an outsider, they actually instinctively make sense to us. Yeah. And I think where you um, just capture this brilliantly is that you do manage to articulate that. As I say, you have a nuanced argument, you allow the room for the reader to make up their own mind, but you also do capture this, um, this idea of the confliction and um, the wonderful chapter in here, the psychology of imperialism. Um, I love the title, Empire State of Mind. That was going to be the title of the book, actually, at one interesting, stage. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. What, what made you decide not to go for that? Because my first book also had a song title uh, as its title. It was mm. originally called If You Don't Know Me By Now. Yeah. And it, it was a disaster because no one knew what the book was about. And so I just trusted my um, publishers to know better. And I think Empire, Empire Land explains what it is better. But I appreciate your honest insight there that um, the editor was pushing for you to be angrier, but you wanted to be true to yourself. And it, you are true to yourself in this. You're true to yourself in the Gullingwalla Bog documentary, the one that we showed in the introduction there, because you are so self-deprecating. You honestly own up to not knowing. I know James O'Brien in the podcast with you said he was surprised that you didn't know more. Um, and I guess that's just an assumption that um, someone from, um, you know, a, a background which is not ours, might make. Um, but by doing so, you invite the reader to share your position, to share your personal journey of discovery. I wondered if you would, um, at this moment, I'm just gonna ping around a fair bit because there's so much to get through and I wanna leave enough time at the end for the audience to have questions as well. Empire Day, you begin with talking about it in your introduction, um, sorry, chapter one, I should say, and by the end of the book, this is like a really good example of how you do see both sides 
of the, the argument. You provide us with a solution in chapter one, and then by the end, you're actually saying, well, hang on a minute, maybe there's a few little flaws there. Talk us through that. Talk us through the origins of Empire Day and what your argument pro or against it might be. Yeah, I guess I used Empire Day as a gentle introduction into the whole subject of Empire. Empire Day was something that was set up by a man called Lord Meath, who was this old Etonian, very establishment figure, very rich. And he did loads of good works, you know, helped various groups and set up charities and so on. And he has also campaigned to start Empire Day in the early 19, I think, by 1918, I think it got established. And it was a half day holiday for kids on Queen Victoria's birthday, where kids would celebrate everything empire had done for Britain, you know, the food, the colonies and so on. And it was obviously quite a nationalistic thing to do. But I quite like the idea of adopting it in the modern age. It actually still exists. Commonwealth Day is a successor to Empire Day, and that is still celebrated. Um, and I like the idea of having an Empire Awareness Day where we remind ourselves of all our heritage. It's like some of them aren't controversial. Some of them are things like our language. Um, you know, Wembley Stadium was called Empire Stadium. The Scouts were going to be called the Imperial Scouts. And, you know, fingerprinting was initially developed in Calcutta. There's so many things that come from empire that I thought that, that'd be a good way of kind of teaching it. But it was only kind of a, a half serious suggestion. And by the end of the book, I realized you need a more profound education, really. You know, it's odd that people leave school knowing so much about the Tudors and the Great Fire of London and World Wars One and Two, And in general, they don't know anything about empire. And it's the biggest thing that happened to us, I think. It's the thing that explains most of us, most about us as a country. Also, it's the way other countries see us. So people in India see us as the former empire. People in America see us as the former empire. But we see ourselves as the country that won World War II. And I think that's dysfunctional and weird. And on that point, in terms of how other people view us and how they view their own history, um, you speak eloquently in, com in comparing other countries look at Germany, you look at the US. Um, expand on that in terms of um, how we can learn from other nations. Yeah, um, New Zealand has recently completely uh, changed its national curriculum to teach colonial history in a more fair way. So we should look at that. Um, America, even though we like to see, see them as more dysfunctional than we are, are actually further ahead of us in talking about things in that there's a national conversation happening there about reparations for slavery. Whereas we're, we're still at the stage about, of saying, oh, did slavery even happen in Britain? It did. Um, and we're still at the stage of arguing about racism exists. That is still a conversation that happens in our national media where I think in America it's generally accepted that it, it does. But Germany is the best example, even though I think it's generally bad to compare empire to the Nazis. The way they've dealt with their difficult history of World War II is an example to us. I mean, they do so many things. So they have a film scene and an art scene that regularly confronts the Holocaust. They have Holocaust memorials in the center of many cities. Uh, they have, um, in Berlin, they have something called stumble stones where you'll walk out of a house and there'll be something on the pavement telling you the names of the Jewish family who were abducted from that house, where they died. So their history is something they live with. Whereas we ignore, either ignore it or we want to take comfort from our history rather than learn from it and become better. Um, they have a much more proactive relationship with their difficult history. And I think you're right to say um, comparing histories is problematic and this balance sheet approach of history, you, you kind of like um, argue against that. You argue against people comparing empires, which empire is the worst. Yes, and actually, the, you, that's a very good point. You know, you mentioned at the start that survey, there's a lot of mm. empire nostalgia in Britain. You know what? There's a lot of empire nostalgia amongst the Sikhs. You know, we tend to view Sikh empire as this glorious cosmopolitan time, which was, you know, which was so generous to everyone it touched. And it probably wasn't like that. It was probably violent in its own way. So I think empire nostalgia is not just something that afflicts the Brits. The problem is we suffer from, suffer from it the worst. I'm not going to say anything on that point, but the audience might have a few questions for you, Satnam. So I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you face up to them at that point. Um, and also, I suppose 
this relates quite well into you made you made that reference to slavery the selective amnesia the book is just brilliant in talking about this idea that britain celebrates very much the abolition of slavery but not its fundamental role in um actually pioneering slavery and certainly like shipping people around the world tell us a bit about that yeah actually it's a very current subject because jeremy clarkson wrote a controversial column yesterday saying you know what we never talk about everything that the british did to abolish slavery they went they did so many amazing things and it's like you know what yeah i can accept that we abolished slavery but you cannot mention it without mentioning we sent three million africans across the atlantic that it made up the equivalent of six percent of our national gdp you know that we compensated the slave owners by 20 million pounds and paid the slaves nothing. That that debt was so huge, we only stopped paying it off five years ago. So I would say you've got to remember all those things on the same plane. Problem is we don't. So Michael Gove will give a speech as he did at the start of the Brexit campaign saying, you know what, we should be proud of our history. We abolished slavery. It's like, yeah, but you can't say that without mentioning the three million lives. You know, but that's the idiotic, cartoonish way in which empire is discussed in this country. And it's kind of maddening for anyone who knows anything. I mean, I'm not even an historian. I don't know how your head doesn't explode if you're an historian in this country, because the public discussion is so stupid. It's toxic and it's triggering. And I think even if you aren't a historian, but you are a follow of the way history is being dissected and attacked. Um, yes, you, could, you can have a very emotional response to it. I found that reading your book was a visceral experience. It was a roller coaster of emotions. Um, the joy that someone had actually put something together and I felt seen for the first time. Wow, that's really amazing to hear that actually. And so many people have said that and I can't tell you how amazing that is because that's how I felt writing it. You know, I was on a roller coaster, man like fresh revelations. I would dread opening a new book, but it felt futile, you know, to read, go to bed reading about massacres and genocides. And it's very hard to explain to people in your life why you're depressed. Um, but I'm so glad that it was worth it because if you're going through the same experience, that means I've managed to tell the story in a truthful way. Absolutely, I think so. And I think um, we've, we've spoken about this a lot in terms of the education and the lack of colonial. Um, empire education that we've both had we both studied the same subject at the same university and um but perhaps we have a slightly different childhood i remember my dad is very much the sanjeev Bhaskar character from goodness gracious me everything indian so empire was taught to me throughout my childhood the problem i had was that it was taught at home and the disparity with what i then learned in school the dual identity, there was this massive like conflict. And as a teenager, you're questioning your parents anyway, right? It made me question what they were saying. So this powerful oral history was demoted because the hierarchy of the Western written word did not reflect it. And I think as you talk about this idea of um, decolonizing your mind, we'll come on to that word, I very much had to go through that experience, but possibly from a slightly different starting point. My dad, again, would insist that we watch a Remembrance Day commemorations every year to pay tribute to everybody who fought in the world wars. But his running commentary would be, why aren't your grandfathers, maternal and paternal, being invited to this? They both fought in World War II. Um, as many people watching in our audience, the diaspora here, will be sharing that kind of, so, you know, I had that kind of um, running commentary but as I say, the, the kind of the hierarchy of mainstream culture, education, um, and certainly in terms of the public narrative that we both knew in growing up, feeling like that outsider. I wanted to kind of like just jump to your um, beautiful revelatory point about Enoch Powell. Um, so from my childhood to your childhood, Southall girl to Wolverhampton boy. I loved how you talk about your parents' experience there, um, emigrating around that time. But also, if you could just tell us a little bit about the Irish community's experience in Wolverhampton as well, because one of the big rev revelations, first Enoch Powell, and also the Irish-Scottish um, relationship with the idea of 
empire. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Irish, the surprise for me was there was an Irish community, almost the same areas of Wolverhampton where my parents ended up 100 years beforehand. And everything that happened to them happened to the Sikhs in that they weren't allowed to live in certain houses. They were, you know, persecuted by the police. You know, they weren't allowed to do certain jobs. They were, they spoke a different language, you know? And it was odd, it was so surprising that this had already happened. And this is, tends to be the thing that repeats itself throughout British history. We forget, one generation of immigrants forgets as, you know, the experience of the, of the other one. But within Ong Powell, he's a man who's kind of haunted me my whole life in that, you know, local MP. He appears in each, all of my books. And um, what I didn't understand until I started reading imperial history that the reason he felt the way he did is because he was a massive imperialist, you know? He was someone who wanted to be Viceroy of India. It was his ambition in life. And he even learned Urdu to do the job and then the job disappeared. And it was the biggest tragedy of his life that he ended up you know, not being able to be Viceroy. And the reason he fundamentally objected to multiculturalism of the kind my parents introduced to Wolverhampton is that it demanded that races be treated equally. Whereas imperialism, as he saw it, had white people in charge and brown people following their instructions. And that blew my mind. I was like, oh my God, how did I not understand that? The other moment you alluded to earlier that really blew my mind was about decolonization. When I realized I've been colonized was Judith Singh's story, you know, the, the man who inherited the Sikh empire. And I was reading about him and I realized actually the first thing the British did when they conquered any Indian kingdom is they, they put the children through a British education. That's the way you defeat the Sikh empire. It's not on the battlefield. And that's what happened to Dulip Singh. He became the perfect English gent, you know, went to, went to Britain and became a friend of Queen Victoria, but then rebelled and tried to get in touch with his roots. And I realized I was on the exact same journey. You know, I had supposedly a brilliant education, but unlike you, my parents didn't teach me much. And I didn't see, read a single brown person until my final term at Cambridge. And I had been colonized. And it was amazing to realize that, you know, because I always thought I was really well educated. I, I thought I was, I had a balanced input, but it, it was only, you know, you kind of slowly realize it, but your book really helped me articulate it. Um, it helped me realize, oh, there was a hierarchy. That's what was happening. Something was being displaced with something else. And I think that's why it's brilliant, as you allude to the younger generation who endlessly inspire me. Um, are creating, but also supporting platforms which are sharing our history. Um, totally, yeah. In, and so we, in a way that we didn't have. So we probably spoke Punjabi at home. You know, we I, we watched Bollywood movies at home. We had lots of Punjabi culture, but everything in our lives in our education was designed to make us value the Western forms more, to value the Western novel, to value Hollywood over Bollywood, to value English, you know? And I got to the age of 44 until I understood that. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is incredible. And it's, I think this is part of what I relate to. It resonates, that, that visceral experience, a roller coaster of emotion. There were times where I was reading, and my husband and I, who you know, were snatching the book off each other to make sure who could finish it fast, <laughs> first. And of course, there was points where I was like reading, then one would have to reread that sentence again. And then I'd look over and say, damn, he went there. There is no holding back. And we would be like flagging things up, like make sure you read that paragraph. Like, he went there. Like, oh. So yes, no, there was a visceral experience there. On the education point, I thought it was really amusing. Um, jumping from your reference to the public school education, um, the British education that um, someone like Dilip Singh had, jumping to a different educational point anti-intellectualism. Now, Jeremy Paxson makes this point in his book on Empire as well. And I just love the way that you expand on it in your own style. Um, tell the audience a little bit about that, the history of that and how we, we still have that. Yeah, um, yes. I guess we're still talking about how imperialism shapes our psychology, which is what decolonization is about. I'm amazed to read a message in the chat from someone saying, I'm your father's generation. I've only just realized that I've been colonized. That's incredible, you know? That is incredible, that um, is incredible. But I think lots of people are going through this journey. Um, but there's a chapter on how imperialism and colonization affects our psychology. And I go through various things. 
I think we have like a history of jingoism that goes back to imperialism. We have a history of exceptionalism, this obsession with being different from everyone else. So we don't have to obey the rules, hence Brexit and our, the way we approach the pandemic. But one of the things I talk about is our distrust of cleverness in that in empire, at the height of empire, um, there was a preference in the colonial service to appoint British people who had third class degrees from Oxford. Because if you appointed someone with a first class degree, they might be too clever. They might think about what they're doing. And empire always valued action over thought. Empire was for people who did things. That's why imperialists were said to be created on the playing fields, you know? And sport was seen as a great analogy for empire, you know, play the game. And yeah, so it wasn't a particularly intellectual exercise. And I think we inherit that kind of anti-intellectualism in our, in our culture. I mean, that phrase, too clever by half. Remember that? And I remember Boris Johnson saying about Davis, David Cameron that he was a girly swat. Only in Britain would that be an insult. But I think it continues. We have that tradition from empire of being, you know, reverse snobbish. It's kind of reverse snobbery about clever people. It's such a strange one to get your head around. It's got so many conundrums in it. In a way that we grew up, certainly our era, we celebrated meritocracy. But at the same time, I really relate to your point about if you are a cerebral kid in a certain environment, how you can feel like an outsider um, and where you are um, so much more bang on the timing. I love the way that you have these like wonderful um, contemporary examples. You know, you refer to even in the film um, Matilda, a girl does not get anywhere by acting intelligent. And I think it relates to your point that you make about empire. It's so kind of um, there's the misogyny, there's the anti-intellectualism, there's the race, there's the class. Um, these are kind of some of the things, the hot potatoes that you're trying to unravel, which are obviously very controversial. Yeah, and then there's the genocide and rape. I mean, quite a few people have been asking me if this book is suitable for their kids. And I've been talking to my publisher about maybe writing a kid's version, but you know what? I think it's suitable for kids who, who are doing GCSEs upwards, but maybe not suitable for younger kids. But also this is this history, this happened. And sooner or later, I think everyone should read this stuff. You know, the hardest That's thing, I, what's the hardest thing you found to accept? I mean, I found it really difficult to face up to the way the British people described the Sikhs. That really got me. You know, when they um, said we lacked a ray of intelligence, you know, in the eight, in the Crystal Palace exhibition, when the conservative uh, minister, you know, said we were educationally ill-equipped to deal with modern civilization, you know, stuff like that, I found really hard. Yeah, no, I think, and I think these are the points, um, absolutely, where I was just like, you really went there, you did not censor your words, it was not filtered, and you put it on a page, it's hard, it's really hard, it's really hard to read it, and it makes you question the duplicitous messages that we've been given, linking into the trade that you and I are in, media, you expand in your um, chapter, Selective Amnesia, you alluded to, to it earlier, but if I may just read your quote here, I pitched the idea of a documentary about the true story of the Indian Railways to a producer. His reply, viewers don't like to have their prejudices challenged. The remark depressed me. I also appreciated his frankness, for it is a fact that terrestrial television's increasingly elderly viewers watch railway programs to be comforted and probably wouldn't be interested to learn that their favorite shows are based on a myth. Unfortunately, this is also seemingly what we as a nation want from our history. Those kind of points really hit me as well, because we've talked about this in terms of like researching, pitching, giving access to stories which challenge the stereotypes, and then being told that mm, there's a certain stereotypes we're quite happy to maintain. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I've been, you know what, I've been trying to turn this book into a documentary for such a long time. And it hasn't been easy. I think if I was Nara Ferguson, it would have been commissioned. It took them well over a year to finally agree to do it. You know, it's like, even when you're a bestseller, even then, like, so it's, it's, there's a nervousness around brown people doing this history on TV, you know? But finally it's being done. So I'm looking forward to that. But oh, it's wow. been a very difficult process. 
Is this news? Is this something that you have you shared this information? Oh, I haven't really announced it, but it's gonna it's gonna happen. I mean, it's there's gonna be a two part Channel Four documentary. So, wow, the, breaking um, news, people! You first you first heard it here. Yeah, you can start your shouting now, <laughs> <laughs> and you're complaining. We'll be, we'll be shouting in support, and we'll be doing bhangra at the launch party of that documentary. I just hope it's going to be post pandemic, so we can actually be there for the screening. That's amazing news. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so two part series. On that note, you talk about this in the book, you say, if you had your chance to research this in the original form, there was going to be some travel involved. It sounds very exotic. Tell us about that particular island. And yeah. tell me now with this new information, will this travel and new island feature in the documentary? <laughs> Well, yeah, I was originally, because uh, there's a chapter about that tries to summarize British imperial history, which caused me so much uh, anxiety, because it's such a complicated story. But I was going to go to one of the places where empire is said to begin, which is this tiny island of Run. It's called Run, R-U-N or R-H-U-N. And it's in, in Indonesia. It takes probably four days to get there, even now. And it was, I think, in the 1600s, the only island in the world that had nutmeg or hadn't was known to have nutmeg and the British and the Dutch went to war over it for decades and as a settlement Britain inherited New Amsterdam New York City incredibly for this tiny island so amazing story and I was like you know what I'm gonna go there I'm gonna go to the beginning of empire and then I was gonna go to New Zealand I was gonna go to Tasmania where there's a terrible genocide that happened and I was gonna go to Singapore where lots of interesting imperial history happened but then the pandemic happened and I couldn't even go to Wolverhampton but it was for the best because what I realized is that this is a book about how Britain has been shaped by empire. It's not like all the other stuff. There's so many books about how the empire shaped the world. We all know how empire shaped the world, democracy, driving on the left, blah, 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 colonial violence, you know? And actually I needed to concentrate on here. So in a way the pandemic was a, a great blessing. Although I would actually still like to go to run. So if someone wants to send me, I'll take the ticket. Well, this was the question. <laughs> Will the documentary feature some some foreign travels? No, I think it's going to be focused on um, Britain. Please yeah. tell me it's not going to be filmed via Zoom in your living room because as much <laughs> as we love you, sat now. No, I just we don't want to get. <laughs> I just don't want to get coronavirus. I don't want to get coronavirus filming this bloody thing. But um, no, that's fair enough. <laughs> I think it's something in the UK. If you need any help the documentary front you know just let oh, me yeah, know if you, if you need me to dispatch me to get the footage it could be like gvs in the background <laughs> um on on the mention of run there's a hilarious section in the chapter difficult history and you describe liaising with the the tourism board i won't give it away but people should read that because it's quite <laughs> amusing and it brings me nicely on to the point that you make here you say and then as i continue to fail to get to run which incidentally, uh, a little fact here you say, is the tiny island of Run, which you could actually run around in a matter of minutes. That's quite interesting. So as, as then I continue to fail to get to Run and continue to inform myself about British imperialism, the final nail in the coffin, there turns out to be no consensus on where the British Empire actually began. And very quickly, you talk about during your Jalanwala Bagh documentary, um, self-discovery experience there, you say the debate about when the British Empire ended as well, is there's no consensus on that. Yeah, I mean, when did it start? I mean, you'll find books saying it's, it was Ulster, it was North America, it was the Caribbean, it was India, it was when the East India Company ended and the Crown took over. It, and there's so many arguments about it, but when did it end? Hong Kong, 1997, did it end Suez? Do we still have it? We've still got some territories from empire. You could say you'll find Scottish people and uh, Welsh people saying they've been colonized and they're examples of British empire, which also enables them to forget their role as imperialists, especially Scotland, Glasgow, the second city of empire, Scottish imperialists. And also one mentioned this in the chat. Scottish imperialists were at the forefront of imperial expansion. And it messes around with the Scottish national psychology the idea that they might have been colonized as well as them being colonized, you know? And in terms of this public narrative, which as you say, the Scots, the, that selective amnesia, the racial generalizations, they also persist as well. Yeah, I mean, my, that's one of my main argument about the racism of empire. There's all sorts of ways it, it continues 
today. But yeah, I mean, the stereotypes is the most common example in that, you know, black people were generalized about hugely by empire and the common thought about them as evidenced in the Rudyard Kipling school textbook was that they were lazy and they wouldn't work unless under compulsion, you know, which goes back to slavery. And that is an idea that remains common, let's face it, in the common in, a, in the modern age. And uh, in a, there was a survey in 2017 where 44% of British people said they believe that some races are born to be harder working than others. That means that they think some people are lazier than others. And I think that's a toxic ra racist idea which goes straight back to empire. You can even trace it to the textbooks, you know, which were being taught in the 1950s. So to tackle that, we alluded to it, but we didn't get a chance to really break it down. The word decolonization. I know, I know you have an issue with that particular word. Why? In generally, I've got a view that when you're thinking about tackling this subject, you should be aware there's a violent counter reaction. And the problem with the word decolonization is that in lots of people's minds, it creates the idea of erase, erasure, of things being erased, of white authors being taken off curriculums, when actually it's not that, it's about expanding, it's about widening the curriculum, you know? It's about the fact that you and I went to a good university and then didn't know any, anything about Edu Said and Orientalism and decolonization, that was a failure of education. What we lacked was context, you know? So decolonization is actually, in in keeping with the academic tradition. And I think we should instead talk about widening reading, which is exactly what decolonization is about. So it's almost like um, you're saying we appropriate that word or have a different word because it's so loaded. That word is to do with counseling and really the, uh, the actual reality is campaigning for an expansion. If not that word, which word? Yeah, I think widening is, is, is what I'd prefer to say, look, I wanna widen the curriculum. I mean, that makes much more sense. And it's much less triggering for, for some white people. <laughs> well, this is it, isn't it? It's like, you've got to like step on yeah. eggshells in order not to trigger people. And this is the whole idea of the culture wars. They just make us um, endlessly go around in loops. Um, I'm just trying to that. find a, yeah, I'm just trying to find a middle ground because it's so toxic. And yeah, I may, maybe I'm a bit of a centrist dad. I don't know. Maybe I'm too reasonable. I have had complaints from people that the book isn't angry enough. You know, okay, but you are very angry about the term second generation immigrants. Yeah, I mean, that gets to the heart of the fact that, you know, imperial immigrants and their children aren't really seen as British, you know. Their parents may have arrived as actual citizens on the Windrush. You know, they may have been born in Britain, but they still get called second generation immigrants. In what way are you and I immigrants, you know? I probably used that phrase casually in the past, but I'm never going to use it again because I think it cancels out the real deep reasons why we're here. And I think it's brilliant because you do articulate that, that I now will not use that. I will push against that. Um, and I'm sure there's many people in the audience which, uh, who agree with you, who might reevaluate their association with that terminology as well. Um, you talk about there is you know, a long, long history. Let's not even talk about first generation, second generation. A particular figure who you mentioned in our um, talk last May, we didn't know at the time that he was going to feature in your book, Dean Mohammed. Now, two questions. First of all, please remind us about him for people who haven't watched that talk. And secondly, you mentioned that you're so fascinated with him that the original idea wasn't to write this history book, but to write a novel about him. So I'm wondering, is that in the pipeline? Oh God, no, no. Um, but no, I was obsessed with him, mainly because, you know, you and I grew up with a narrative that Indians were a kind of new experiment and that we arrived, you know, in the sixties when actually brown people have been in Britain here for centuries. Queen Elizabeth I complaining about too many black people in London. And the first Bengali was born in the 1600s in London. You know, there was a mosque in the 1800s in Woking, I think. And G. Mohammed is yet another example in that he was a soldier who came with an East India Company captain to Ireland first, married an Irish woman called Jane Daly, came to London, set up the first ever curry house, so massively influential in that way. Um, then became this kind of slightly bizarre shampooing massage guy, called himself a shampooing surgeon. 
where he would, I guess, massage people. He actually broke someone's arm once, but he's also hugely popular and became this shampooing surgeon for the king. He had a royal warrant, hugely famous in his lifetime. Also the first Indian to ever write a book in English. It's a terrible book, but he was the first. And a funny, entertaining character that I was never taught about. And there are hundreds of brown people like that who were famous in their lifetime, former slaves, lots of them. And as soon as they die, they get forgotten. This seems to be the way with the imperial story. As soon as they're used, British society forgets about them. And I think if I do do a kid's book, it would be about these figures, you know? We need to give ourselves a higher sense of self-esteem as British brown people. We've been here for centuries and we need to reclaim the story and tell those stories better. I'm with you, Satna. Reclaim, reclaim. Yeah. <laughs> On that note, I'm just going to get you to um, finish my very final question and then we're going to go to the audience. Mm. We're going to open up the chat and we're going to ask a few people to ask their questions directly as well. On the Mohammed and on the note of making a dedicated children's book, of course you're going to start with language. You've just mentioned shampoo there. Please, um, for the for my dad, who'd love to hear you do the Sanjeev Bhaskar impersonation, <laughs> how every word was Indian. Can you just fill us in there? And then or I'll some of the Indian words. Questions. Yeah. Well, some of them weren't Indian. My actual favorite thing is, you know, the phrase kui, you know, when you might go kui, that comes from Aboriginal Australians. It was a cry used out in the bush. Isn't that amazing? That is um, amazing. But Indian words, of course, yeah. bungalow. Um, the first bungalow, you know, in Britain was built by an East India Company guy at Sezincote House, arguably, um, which is in the Cotswolds. Sandals. Uh, I'm going off the top of my head here. Dinghy, dungarees, veranda, veranda shawl, punch, banj, you know, banj, five, punch, because it has five ingredients in it. That's where it comes from. And my favorite one is loot. I mean, the British stole so much from India that they also stole the word <laughs> for stealing. Loot is a Hindu word, lut, apparently. And um, yeah, I mean, there's thousands of those. There's an entire dictionary of those terms. And that one word gives us a wonderful hat tip to uh, also um, a book club friend, William Dalrymple, who was on here last year with the wonderful Jasa Alawalia, a very illuminating talk. And um, on the anarchy and I know you give him a lot of credit in the book as well um, we're going to now open up the Q&A so please feel free Satnam with me we'll scroll down um, yeah. Satnam's kindly agreed to be with us for another 20 minutes I think we should make sure that we do release him at half past so let's try and get through a few questions here I like all these Indian we'll words that are coming pajama yeah I forgot about that Jim Carner. curry yep punch <laughs> I've said that um, anyway, sorry, I'll let you ask. Okay, so on William Dalrymple, Jatinder Singh here says, um, and this is, I think, referring to the talk last year, that William Dalrymple believes a colonial museum would be a way to address um, some of this absence in the public narrative. Um, you're quite, you know, you, you grapple with the idea of museums, and of course you talk about the colonial artefacts that are... Um, taken hostage in British museums. What would your notion be about a museum that tries to rectify that narrative? Yeah, I like the idea of a colonial museum. Actually, a few people have been touching me already. There's loads of interesting projects happening on that theme. Um, there's something called the Immigration Museum, which mm. sort of exists and it needs, I think it needs a more permanent home. That's a brilliant idea because I think we forget as a nation how immigration has changed this country. It's not just us, it goes back to the 12th century, the Jews who were massacred by the British. And it, we forget we are an island of immigrants. I think that would change our national conversation about race and multiculturalism if we accepted that fact. So I'd love to see that happen. In terms of statues, I mean, I wrote something half jokingly for the paper today, which is that we shouldn't tear them down necessarily. The ones that are controversial, we should have an annual day where we pelt them with tomatoes. They have this in Spain, right? Have a festival where we pelt Lord Clive and all the other colonialists with tomatoes. Then you can use the tomatoes with compost. I think and that was a screen grab that I used right in your introduction. You wrote about the, that actually this morning um, for the time. Yes. And, and I got to say, it was meant quite lightheartedly. Needless to say, there's been a barrage of 
people saying I should be salted with tomatoes myself and uh, and racist abuse, which is what happens every time you write about empire. I, I bet, I bet. Did we, I'm just going to give you a moment to select any questions in particular. Oh yeah, yeah I'm not really good at scrolling through you. There's loads coming, I can't focus, hold on. Um, Abdul asks, unlike Sikhs, we Gujaratis are not known as a martial race, but like Sikhs, we followed the Brits everywhere. Any thoughts on the part we have played and are playing in Britain? So I guess he's just asking to maybe to expand your analysis to the wider South Asian community. Yeah, I don't know enough about the Gujaratis, but very interestingly, at the same time as the Sikhs were deified as the military race because they took the side of the British, the mutiny, the Bengalis were described as effeminate and not having the hearts for fighting, even though the British had relied on them. They were the, like the heart of their fighting force. But just because they were involved in the rebellion, they decided, oh no, they're dispensable. And this is the thing about the racist generalizations. They changed all the time. So one minute, you know, when, when immigration started happening in Britain, there was a view that Indians and Pakistanis were lazy. And there's official documents in the colonial office saying, Pakistanis and Indians are lazy the really hardworking ones are the West Indians. And then 10 years later, it's, it flipped. Suddenly, West Indians are lazy and we are really hardworking. And the same thing happened after slavery in that the indentured labors, you know, the Indians and the Chinese, sometimes they were like, oh, the Chinese are great, the Indians are crap. It just, because it was racism, it was complete nonsense, you know? And they just said whatever worked for them. Unfortunately, this nonsense continues to shape the way we see the world. And I think you're right in also being very open in addressing that these racial generalizations aren't only um, absorbed into the mainstream society, they're also observed into various communities of immigrant descent, who then believe those stereotypes themselves. And um, it's, it's as shocking to the outsider when, you know, one discloses colorism in our community to also disclose racism in our community as well. Um, and when I talk Absolutely. about our community, I'm talking about the Sikh and the Punjabi community. I'm not going to generalize with other people, but um, I think you're absolutely right that that dominant narrative can be so pervasive. And yeah. We need to face up to that. And the British notions of caste, you know, they because they wrote everything down, they codified everything. So they took what they thought were Indian notions of caste. And those definitions are still used by the Indian government today to decide which groups get, you know, because, you know, they have positive discrimination when it comes to certain castes. Those notions go straight back to empire. And actually, there was something we, I wanted to talk touch upon, the farmers' protest mm. earlier. And a lot of uh, Sikhs who have profiles in the media are getting quite a lot of crap at the moment. I am too, from people endlessly message me saying, why aren't you doing more about the farmers' protests? Why are you banging on about empire? You know, you should be talking about this. First of all, I am. I'm tweeting and Instagramming a lot. Secondly, it's not the way my job works in that I'm not in India. I can't suddenly start writing about the farmers' protests, you know. I, if there wasn't a global travel ban, I'd probably try to get there and write about it. And thirdly, there is an imperial connection, you know, because why are the Indian police so violent towards the Sikh, Sikhs and everyone else? It's because they have taken the violent ideology and the violent way the colonial police worked. They deal with the Indian public in the same way the British did. There's a direct link, you know? And also another imperial connection is something that the other Ermandeep tweeted about the other day. One of the reasons why, you know, Modi's disastrous government is not seen for where it is in Britain is that we have very nostalgic views, British people do, of India, based on all these films and all these TV series of, of India as this great democracy. They want to believe that they gave us this brilliant democracy when actual fact, you know, it's worse than Donald Trump's America, you know. So I think there's an imperial explanation there. And finally, of course, we've got the BJP wanging on about, you know, history, saying, you know, certain forms of history aren't acceptable, trying to change history, saying people who promote certain kinds of history aren't Indian enough. Exactly the same thing is happening in the UK, you know. And I think there is imperial explanation for what's going on, for some of what's going on around the farmers' protests. And we all feel very strongly. I just wish our community would not attack each other all the bloody time. You know, I think this is one of the occasions where we're pretty much on the same side. And so stop sending me DMs about it. <laughs>
You've been told, people, stop sending in DMs. <laughs> but also DMs from people who haven't looked at my Instagram that day saying, why aren't you saying anything about it? I literally have. I think right, I'm let it go now. I think criticism, Sandeep Mahal has said spot on, um, Satnam, you're getting a few comments there as well. I think criticism internally in communities is probably across the board in terms of most communities, which have some kind of defined number, which they, you know, one can even say there is a community. A colonial hangover, of course, um, is, is the sedition law in India. Yeah. It hasn't been changed. And this is why the activists, the protesters, um, members who are very vocal in the people's movement are being imprisoned and um, it's it's absolutely um, crazy and you know we do we do call for their release but on the point about not using your platform if you just want to just make that one at the point I was going to ask you this towards the end after mm. our audience questions but, but as you have mentioned it um, to clarify that point you're not in India you're not someone who's able to do the journalism, which I suppose there are times journalists writing. Yeah, there's, we have an India correspondent. And to be honest, I've been involved in trying to get my editors to write about it. And to be honest, they have. I think it's gradually becoming more covered in the international media. The BBC has been doing more and more stuff about it. And yeah, it really matters. And I don't know any prominent Sikh who's not trying to do what they can. Um, but, you know, also a divide and rule is what the British loved. You know what I mean? Look at the end of the Sikh empire. The British loved that. Who benefited? The British. So I think we should attack each other less and um, support each other. And I think also this is the notion that everything that is being done online is um, taking a certain hierarchy in comparison to what's been happening offline. Um, I, for myself, know many people who are supporting the movement in an offline capacity. And on many occasions, certainly in terms of my relatives, we've been asked to do that because of the harassment that's going on, not just in Delhi, but in the villages as well. So I think things will come out in the wash as well. As you say, that you are campaigning in terms of asking your editors to have better coverage. Um, but that might not be something that you can actually openly talk about up until yeah. this moment. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I am just going to scroll through the questions and just, mm. I just want, I feel like we need to make sure that the audience feel a part of this discussion and it's not just the um, Amun and Satnam show. <laughs> Adam Barron says, any views on David Baddiel's new book, if you read it or not? Yes, I do have lots of views on that book. I love that book. And um, I think it's, you can't understand racism in Britain without confronting anti-Semitism. I think is essential. I've got a long uh, relationship. Well, I have, I've had a long journey in terms of understanding British Jews. And it goes back to the fact that actually one of my first ever experiences of racism at school was an anti-Semitic experience in that I didn't know any Jewish people. I don't think there's very few Jewish people in Wolverhampton, but we were being taught the Holocaust. And there was a faction in my class who laughed all the way through the teaching then we went to see Schindler's List and they laughed throughout the film. And I was so mortified. I, 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 it depressed me so much, but it made me realize that often racism begins with anti-Semitism. And that is also, if you read Robert Winder's book, Bloody Foreigners, about the history of immigration in Britain, whatever happened to the Jews happens to other communities eventually. And so that's why I've been very outspoken on anti-Semitism. There's a lot of commonality between the Sikh community and the, British, and the Jewish community. We're the same size in the UK and internationally. I think we're the fourth or fifth biggest religion. People don't generally understand us. We have beards, you know. Um, sometimes, you know, the, there's, there's a faction who are very observant of the religion, but then the majority aren't necessarily so much. So we have a lot of the same issues. And I think there's a lot we can learn from uh, the Jewish community about how they talk about themselves. But David Baddiel's book is not only out at the same time, we're sharing a same similar slot on the bestseller charts, but I think we're arguing the same thing, which is basically, we need to have more sane conversation. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to agree with David, but just let's start talking about it in a more sensible way, you know? And that's all he wants and it's all I want. I think no one can argue with that. I think that's very, very fair. Um, a question that um, Robin poses, 
She asks, um, only yesterday, The Guardian reported that the Johnson government plans to penalize those organizations like the National Trust who are looking at the implications for them of reassessing colonial history. And this is what I alluded to in my introduction, this idea that your book is so bang on timely. What are your thoughts about that particular? Um, yeah, it's unbelievable what's happening there, because basically, National Trust is investigating, doing proper academic research into the imperial links of some of their houses, which is what they exist to do, right? You learn about the history when you go there. And uh, there's a massive backlash. The, ch the head of the Charity Commission, who is a conservative politician, is saying she's going to investigate them. You've got the government saying, you know, they should have their fund funding cancelled, although I don't think they have any funding. They're a massive membership organisation, but they're attacking the National Trust for, for being woke. But this is what's happening, you know, this is the new culture war. This is what conservatives are doing, you know, to make themselves look popular. They're de defending British history against the woke people. And it's, you know what it is? It's cancel culture, basically. If, if Black Lives Matter was saying, stop doing that research, we don't like it, they would say that is cancel culture. But when the National Trust are doing it, it's just woke people. What they're doing is saying, we don't want academic research into things that we find uncomfortable, into slavery, into imperialism, right? And it's brainwashing. It's actually just one stop away from burning books. I think we should all get much more angry about what's happening. And as you say, this is happening right now. I believe there's a, a review, a government review on the 23rd of February on this very matter. Um, Christian Guru Murphy asked you a really great question in his podcast for Channel 4 on this point that you make about woke. Is racism underpinning war on woke? Absolutely. I mean, you've got to remember where the word woke comes from. It came from the African-American experience where people said we need to be awake to examples and illustrations of white supremacy in our lives. It was a really radical, important movement. You know, it's a great word. It's been hijacked by the right wing to mean anything that they disagree with. Anything that's right, you know, mildly left wing to their fascist views, basically. And as soon as anyone uses the word woke in a debate or in an article, I stop reading. Because I'm like, you know what, you're not interested in, in genuine knowledge gaining. You just want to demonize the opposition and that fortunately is the way things work now in that with the culture wars it's kind of like a football team mentality in that you've got to you have your team everything the other team does is wrong everything you know everything you do is right and unfortunately that's the way politics and history is playing out increasingly and again i'm just going to plug how this is going against that binary opposition um, going against the black and white argument. Saurav asks, um, Satnam, I just wanted to ask as a young person who shares your passion for writing and also wanting to widen the curriculum to ensure that the future generations are given a more balanced view of empire, what actions do you think we should take to push for this change at a grassroots level? Yeah, I mean, what do we do? I think there's a whole load of campaigns to get the curriculum changed. So you can join those petitions and there's campaigns to, you know, make museums repatriate their items. There's, you can be a reader, you can tweet. But yeah, I'm, I'm struggling. Like, what can you do as an individual? I think knowledge is power mainly. I mean, just read and talk about it because that's the only way anything is going to get changed. And why don't you write things, you know? Write books. It takes a long time and it's a nightmare. But um it can be important, especially at this time. That wasn't a very good answer. I'm, I no, struggle no, no. to know what to do. I mean, yeah, I mean, ultimately we need a better national curriculum, but I don't know how you achieve that. You're getting a lot of praise, Satnam, for speaking out. Um, Sukhvinda just said a lot of universities are working on decolonizing the curriculum. This is something mm. that you'll be across and you talk about quite widely. Um, but again, there is that backlash against them at the same time. Dejbal Ralmal says, a legacy of empire. To what extent do you believe structural health inequalities are um, a part of a kind of a racial hangover? Health, in, health inequalities. Yeah, health inequalities. I'm afraid I don't know enough about that. I mean, my book argues about structural racism, really. Um, that's my main argument. Okay, fair enough. Um, a departure from other books. Um, someone writes here, sorry, the scrolling is taking my mind of its own. Um, 
In researching this book, Roman asks, what was the most harrowing and shocking event that you discovered? That's a good question. Um, the mutiny, what happened after the mutiny was pretty harrowing, the way all Indians were targeted. Some people were buried alive, you know, people strapped to the end of guns and blown up, you know, at the end of cannons, whole villages raised to the ground, purely in racial revenge, you know, because they wanted to punish the people who had actually killed Brit British people. Um, the Morant, was it the Morant Bay Rebellion of 1865, where 400 Jamaicans were killed in often very dramatic, deliberately torturous ways. Um, there was that incident, and I can't remember which, where it was, but a bunch of Indian soldiers were put into a fives court, which is basically a squash court. I think a couple of hundred Indian soldiers shot. I found that particularly harrowing, maybe because we played fives at school, and I know how big that court is. But the worst thing, obviously, was Tasmania, you know, where uh, four to 8,000 Tasmanian Aborigines were wiped out in a genocide. And it was a genocide. It was the example used when people were developing, developing the international definition of the word genocide. I mean, a bunch of settlers basically set up a line and walked down the island, you know, shooting them like they were pheasants, you know, or killing them by other means. And by the end of it, there are none left. And that's incredible. I mean, I found that unbelievably harrowing. Um, but yeah, yeah, not great. I don't want to end on a, a negative note, <laughs> and a depressing note then, but it needs to be acknowledged. And I think you're, you're very right to bring that up. A few little questions. I'm just going to read out some questions because I know that we're pressed for time. So I'm afraid that if we invite people on, you're not going to get a chance to get through some questions. I'm going to fire a few at you now. Mm. Rupinda says, what are your thoughts about the Queen's honours? Uh, OBE, would you take a knighthood? Um, I always say I'd like a knighthood because my initials are SSS. If I was a sir, it'd be Sir Satnam Singh Sangera. But um, no one has offered me an honor or, or, or anything. I don't think it's ever going to happen. But I haven't got a problem with the phrase OBE for the reasons... I explained earlier about the Sikhs being involved in empire. If hundreds of thousands of Sikhs fought for empire, I don't think it goes against, you know, I don't think it's going against them to take an award, you know, that has empire in it because okay. we are involved in the imperial history, aren't we? But I respect people who do reject them as well at the same time for that reason. Amadeep, Amadeep Madras just a um, message saying, phew, on um, Avatar, Avatar. Amadeep Madra OBE, yes. Avatar's asking um, thoughts on your next book, any topics that are of interest to you? You know what, that's like, that's like having just given birth and then being asked if you're gonna have another baby. Although you've never given birth, <laughs> so I don't know. Yes, I know, that's probably not the best example. <laughs> uh, kidney stone, maybe I've had one of those, that was painful. Um, no, I don't fancy having another kidney stone. I, I generally, my books seem to come eight years apart. You know, I really love my career in journalism. And the problem with writing books is they're very lonely. And I feel I've been locked down for four years. You know, I just like everyone in the world, I want to get out there and travel and have some fun and not read about massacres. So I want to see where this book takes me in other ways. The subject matter is quite, you know, interesting. Um, and of course, making a documentary is very collaborative. So you'll find that that is going to be the perfect antidote. But it's just, as you say, navigating through the pandemic. Um, uh, we're asked by Guldeep, what in regards to colonization, what role does socialization play in this? What's your experience on that particular point? Well, I, I'm not sure what's meant by socialization, but I do go into how the racism of empire was reflected in the way British people socialized with Indians, in that, you know, at the height of empire, the British people had their own social clubs and Indians weren't allowed in them, you know? And that continued in post-war Britain in that, you know, brown people weren't allowed to go to the same clubs. We've forgotten this, the same nightclubs as white people in post-war Wolverhampton. They were working men's clubs that had a color bar in Wolverhampton until 1984. And also I would say even today, there are certain pubs in the Midlands where you won't go if you're brown. And that goes straight back to empire, that kind of social division Probably not what she meant by socialization, but I've given a vaguely relevant answer, hopefully. <laughs> There's a definitely a relevant answer. Do you want to ask, answer one or two more? Or you know should we conclude this I, I'm, I'm happy to carry on, yes, fine. Oh, brilliant. Okay, well, I think yeah. Amandeep Madra is okay with that, and we can also mm. edit this down, certainly take off my 
technical glitch at the beginning. It's not my strong point, people. So we can keep this going. Manpreet Kaur asks a really nice question here. She says, thank you for writing this book, Satnam. Do certain moments of Sikh history, good one, let's refocus mm -hmm. it back to this point. Do certain moments of Sikh history while the empire, and she says, um, let's just go a bit more further, or work as a generative moment for collaborate for elaborating your critique of this long shadow. It's a ghostly kind of shadow on empire. So I, th I think she wants you to extrapolate the Sikh empire notion here. Yeah, I'm, I don't I'm not entirely understand the question, but I did learn a lot about the Sikh empire. And the most striking for, thing for me was how it ended, you know, is this incredible infighting, like within about 10 years, everyone had murdered each other. And the only people who benefited were the British, because like, we were the last group to be kind of conquered and annexed in by the British, you know? And if we hadn't imploded after Ranjit Singh's death, maybe things would have been different. And I think it's the old thing about divide and rule and why sometimes we are our own worst enemy. And I think Amandeep Madra and his team, and I know there's a very um, big team there, were just brilliant at hosting those various exhibitions. There was one years ago on World War One, and one quite recently on Maharaja Ranjit Singh. Um, I know that you attended it and you support it as well. So um, people, please carry on supporting this platform and that team as well. V Walker, um, she's got a brilliant um, comment here. V, again, another book club friend and a fantastic author. Please do get her book. She says, You've been trolled over this book. So we're circling back right to the beginning of this um, talk about the context, the backlash, as well as the very positive praise that you've had, critical acclaim, bestseller. She says, you've been trolled over this book. Trolls skulk in the shadows by their very nature and authors cannot reply, she being an author, because it tends to stoke the fire of hatred. If you could say something, anything to the worst of your recent trolls, sitting in front of them now, what would you say? And is there a connection between the proliferate, prof it's late people, proliferation of trolling and the legacy of colonialism. Brilliant one, V. She's all up there. <laughs> I don't know if I connected to, connected to colonialism, but I've been thinking a lot about the trolling recently because in Fleet Street, everyone gets trolled, right? And so there's a view that and you don't complain about it. So I've never really complained about it. But I'm also one of the few writers of colour, right? Columnists of colour. And in the last few weeks, because it's intensified, my publishers who are probably a bit less, a bit nicer than Fleet Street, keep on asking me if I'm okay. And that's actually made me reflect on it. And I've, I've, I've realized that I've had 10 years of it and it's not, it's not okay. You know, why have I put up with this? So I've suddenly started complaining about it more. So I've started taking people on on Twitter and, but paradoxically, it now upsets me a bit more because when someone suddenly cares and, and lots of people are messaging me saying supportive things, oddly makes you made me quite emotional because no one's ever asked me before you know and I know I interviewed David Harewood recently the black actor and he said he felt something very similar with the Black Lives Matter movement because finally people were asking how he felt you know after after decades of you know undermining and minimizing his, his experience of racism suddenly people are like tell me how you feel I want to listen and I feel a bit like that it's like shit you know what, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable for social media companies to make billions of pounds out of this hatred. And something should be bloody done. And it's not acceptable that our, all our black footballers get it routinely. It's not acceptable that David Harewood says he doesn't switch his phone on now till midday, because when he does, there's someone there saying you're a black bastard, you know? It's not acceptable that a couple of weeks ago, I couldn't use social networking because Whatever I said on whatever subject, I'd have like a hundred trolls saying, using the P word or telling me to get back to where I came from, you know? So yeah, I have thought a lot about it and it needs to change. I couldn't agree more. And I hope, Fee, you feel like there's some advice there. Um, I, for one, I'm really anti-social media. I'm kind of like an anomaly when it comes to people working in the media. I'm brilliant offline. Can you get me offline? Brilliant. Online? Not so much. I can kind of like sidestep it for that very reason. Just for Ala Walia, um, another brilliant host for the book club, and I'm sure we'll be doing stuff in season two. He asks a question um, relating back to the point that we made about that you started writing this book and wanting to do a lot of traveling, and you wrote this book in lockdown in your flat. Is it 
was it very much a book that you've always wanted to write or was it a consequence of, of COVID? I've adapted the question there a little bit just so I hope you don't mind. But this idea that, um, yeah. No, I, 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 I avoided writing it for a long time because uh, to be honest, I'm not someone who reads history books. So I, was, I felt like I was incapable of even reading a history book, let alone reading enough to be able to write one of my own. You know, it just felt impossible. But then I realized almost all my books have been like that. At the beginning of the process, I feel like I can't do it. With my memoir, I was like, I can't write. I'm a, what the hell, I'm 29. I'm not going to write a memoir. And it seemed impossible. And similarly, when I wrote my novel, it just, I was like, I can't write. I didn't feel like I had a novel in me, you know? But then you work hard at it over many years and it happens. And I love that experience of feeling like something's impossible and then doing it. And then, but the difference with this book is that normally once you've done it, you expect people to congratulate you at the end. But here, I just feel like there's crowds of people waiting to stab me to death. Um, so that's my reward. I'm not 29. I was 29 when I wrote my, began writing my memoir, someone says. I'm 44 now, as you could probably tell from the white hair. <laughs> the lighting is very good, Satnam. I would, yes. I would just see us, you know, go, go for it. Um, I probably and should go soon because my nieces are made an appearance. Absolutely. We could say hello to your niece as well and to say thank you to them. <laughs> Let's wrap up on that note. It's gone, it's gone to their heads, the fame. I bet it has, but <laughs> deservedly so, because I really do feel like there is a, a useful touch to this book, a useful touch to this bestseller. It's um, timely, well-researched people. We're going to wrap up at this point. I highly recommend you getting your hands on this book, whatever your opinion might be about Empire, whatever you know, um, read this, because I think it will challenge things. I think it will enhance um, knowledge, but also I think it could spark some really wonderful conversations. Next week, please do tune in to Toxification. I had the pleasure of watching the film screened in Southall. Um, it must be over a year ago and Remeth does a brilliant job. Again, it's in keeping with um, the very topical nature of this book club. Empire Land this week, Toxification. <laughs> tapping into the farmers' protest next week. Please do join us. Apologies for the technical glitch at the beginning. But like I said, that's not my speciality. Speciality is support and friendship for someone like that, Nam. You're brilliant. Thank you, Amadeep. Amit. You're brilliant. I love talking to you. And you as well. Thank you so much. Congratulations. And Thanks. thank you very much for the audience for being so patient with us all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs>